Hi, I'm Tom Elliott with Deepwardly Spiritual Direction Services. Welcome to this presentation entitled, Godly Responses to Ungodly Situations. I think this topic is extremely relevant because you and I experience the suffering of ungodly situations pretty much every day, whether very personally or whether we experience it through the media when we see the collective suffering of humanity. And we need to know how we should respond in a Christian way, in a Christ-like way, in a godly way. And so this presentation will offer some very concrete and practical ways for discerning where our suffering is coming from and then discerning a way to respond that would be Christ-like. I really hope that this presentation is deeply practical for you. In fact, I would really invite you to think about a concrete, ungodly situation that you or a family member or a friend is experiencing right now in life, so that as we go through this presentation together, you might be able to discern and apply where the suffering is coming from in this ungodly situation, and what response might be the most helpful or beneficial. So during this presentation, we will look at ungodly situations in our life. I'm going to briefly look at suffering within Christianity. Then we'll look at the five sources of suffering. And then we'll conclude by looking at four particular godly responses, namely when we choose the suffering, when we find intimacy with Christ in the suffering, when we look for meaning, and then a practice called Tonglen. So let's begin at looking at suffering within Christianity. St. John Paul II wrote, Sacred Scripture is a great book about suffering. And ultimately, we are invited to look to Christ who models for us a godly response to ungodly situations. His way must become our way. Now, if we look at sacred scripture, we're going to find numerous important things about suffering, about ungodly situations. First of all, we're going to find that Jesus Christ himself suffered. There are numerous passages that describe his suffering, including the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 33 to 34. We can also see that Jesus indicated that anyone who was going to authentically follow him was also going to experience suffering. In other words, his disciples were going to be called to pick up their own crosses and follow in his way. So if you and I are going to be followers of Christ, we're going to be immersed in the suffering of this world. And St. Paul gives us a beautiful example of that. In fact, some people have even referred to St. Paul as a professional sufferer. That's pretty profound. And we get that from his letters. All throughout his letters, he very clearly describes that he is suffering but that he is responding to that suffering in a Christ-like manner. Suffering, then, is a part of life and a part of our faith. Our Christianity is not meant to take us out of the suffering of the world, but rather it places us at the center of it. In the midst of suffering, we're not invited to be victims, at least not in the popular sense of the word, but instead we're invited to respond in a way that allows us to be transformed and to be transformers. I'm going to say that again. In the midst of this suffering we go through, you and I are called to respond in a way that's not selfish and inward focused, but actually transforms us interiorly and moves us out into the world to be transformers in the world, to bring light, peace, joy, mercy, love to the world today. So let's now look at five particular sources of suffering. I would call two of those sources of suffering godly suffering, and the other three I would call ungodly sources of suffering. So let's look at those. The two godly 
causes or situations of suffering would be suffering caused by God and suffering caused by love. Now, we know that God can never cause evil, yet the Bible does hold God responsible for some forms of suffering, in particular, that God punishes evildoers, especially in the afterlife, and that God lovingly chastises or disciplines his children, as we read about in Psalm 3, verses 11 through 12. The discipline of the Lord, my son, disdain not, spurn not his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves, and he chastises the son he favors. Now, this is very similar to the passage we find in the book of Judith, chapter 8, where we're told that we have been put in the crucible to try our hearts, that in a sense God is purifying us to make us a greater image and likeness of himself, that it's not out of anger and disdain that God puts us in that crucible of suffering, but sometimes we're placed there like a loving father might place a child into that discipline, into that formation for the sake of growth. In addition to the suffering caused by God, we can also talk about suffering caused by love. Love is a source of suffering simply because it requires us to be vulnerable and transparent. The famous Christian writer C.S. Lewis explained the suffering love very beautifully, even poetically, writing, To love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. The only place outside heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers and perturbations of love is hell. You and I have experienced the suffering that can come from love. We've in the past experienced making ourselves so vulnerable, so transparent in love that we were hurt, that someone rejected us in the midst of it. That's a very painful experience of suffering. Now let's look at three causes of suffering that are ungodly, that have nothing to do with God or love. There's the suffering caused by evil spirits, the suffering caused by circumstances, the suffering caused by sin. And once again, as I go through these one by one, I invite you to reflect on your own particular ungodly situation. Which of these causes of suffering is your ungodly situation rooted in? And it might not be just one. It might have parts of multiple ones. But which one primarily is your ungodly situation rooted in? So let's look at the suffering caused by evil spirits. Scripture explains that some suffering is in fact caused by evil spirits. And of course, two examples would include the Gospel of Luke chapter 9, verses 38 to 42, in which Jesus confronts an evil spirit who is tormenting a young boy. And in Luke 13, verse 16, in which Jesus healed a woman who had been physically crippled by Satan. Now, while those examples are fairly extreme, you and I have experienced the suffering that comes from evil spirits. Maybe we've experienced it simply in day-to-day -day temptations. You don't have to live long in this world to know that temptation is a deep suffering for us. It's not easy. So all of us probably every day experience the ungodly situation 
of suffering caused by an evil spirit simply through the temptations that we frequently battle. In addition to that cause of suffering, we can also say that suffering is sometimes caused by circumstances. There is some suffering that can't directly be connected to personal or societal sin, but rather it seems rooted in the broken or unfinished circumstances of our world. For example, there are many forms of natural disasters that cause tremendous suffering and grief. These things remind us of how our world is broken and how our world is still changing. Or there is the suffering caused by accidents and illness, suffering for both the patient and the caregiver. There's the suffering caused by aging. The book of Genesis makes it clear that the primary source of suffering is human sin. In fact, the first three chapters of Genesis offer us a theological explanation for why we no longer live in the perfect world, that at some point, human beings chose to ignore God's will. They chose not to be who God created them to be, but desire to be something else. Really, what they chose to try to be was they tried to be God. So before I go into four particular godly responses to those ungodly situations, I want you to pause a moment and think about which of those causes of suffering is your ungodly situation rooted in? Is it just one, or is it primarily one, but it touches on a couple of others? Take just a moment to think about that. Now let's look at four particular responses to those ungodly situations. And ultimately, all of these responses are simply ways for you and I to continue to be conformed to the image and likeness of Christ. Remember, you and I were created by God to be unique, particular images of Christ for the world today, including in those ungodly situations. And once again, as we go through these, I invite you to think about and reflect on which one might be the most beneficial, the most practical for the ungodly situation that you're currently experiencing in life. Remember, too, that these four responses are not primarily about trying to change the ungodly circumstance or the ungodly people <laughs> in those circumstances, but rather they're about changing our own hearts to being more Christ-like, more gentle, loving, merciful, patient, accepting. So let's look at what it means to choose the suffering, find intimacy with Christ, find meaning, and then the practice of Tonglen. We'll begin with choosing the suffering. This is a great response when our suffering is from relatively minor circumstances that we cannot control. And we find a beautiful example of this in St. Therese of Lisieux, also known as St. Teresa the Little Flower. She tells the story of being a young nun in the convent, and it was her job to sweep. And often, some of the older nuns would come and interrupt her work, and she found herself getting angrier and angrier, that she was becoming frustrated, irritated, agitated at these nuns for bothering the work that she was doing. And then she decided to choose the suffering. What she did was, every morning in personal prayer, she would beg God to send these nuns to her to interrupt her in her work. She asked for the very thing that was irritating her and bothering her. And by doing so, she chose not to be a victim, but she chose to be 
Christ in that situation. She chose to put people over situations and work. And she ended up finding a deep peace in the midst of that suffering. That's something that you and I can do in certain ungodly situations. We can choose, even ask God for the very thing that we've been trying to avoid. This moves us beyond an unhealthy victimhood and it moves us into a healthy sort of martyrdom, what scripture calls a dying to self. I remember years ago, a woman would come to confession and she would come like every week and every week as part of her list of sins, she would confess her irritation at the traffic on her drive home from work each day. She lived in a large city. She would get so frustrated and angry with these drivers. She would call them idiots and stupid. Sometimes she would find herself cussing at them. I'm sure they couldn't hear her, but she would do it nonetheless. Maybe sometimes she even used visual gestures they could see. She talked about how they wouldn't use their blinker. They would cut her off in traffic. They would slam on their brakes. They would change lanes without even signaling or caring who was there. She was so angry. And after weeks and weeks of going to confession about this, I offered her this response. What would it be like if every morning in prayer she asked God for the grace to not feel entitled to the road, but in fact, to ask God for the grace to be last, to be in the final place when driving home, and the grace to put everyone else first, maybe even to beg God to be surrounded by those idiot drivers. And in choosing it, she was being invited into a selflessness of putting other people first. That can be choosing the suffering. That can be a beautiful, godly response to certain ungodly situations. Another response would be to find intimacy with Christ in the midst of our suffering. And this is a great response when our suffering has isolated us or is threatening to isolate us from ourselves or from others or from God. Scripture reminds us that Christ was human in all things but sin. We read that in the letter to the Hebrews. And that as part of that connectedness with humanity, he suffered greatly. And this means that we can find deep intimacy and mutuality with Christ in our suffering. In other words, whatever our ungodly situation is, we can take time to reflect on how Christ went through a very similar ungodly situation. And without making even any further connections, that alone can draw us into a deeper intimacy with Christ. We can begin to see and even to feel Christ's own gentleness, acceptance, mercy, and love in the midst of that ungodly situation. I'll give you an example of that. Years ago, a woman was sharing with me how her best friend had betrayed her with all of the rest of their shared friends. She found herself feeling isolated from the rest of those friends. And it appeared that her best friend had done that, had betrayed her simply to get a very relatively small personal benefit from it. That's a painful situation, but it's also a situation that Jesus Christ himself experienced. So we can go to the Gospels, to the story of Judas betraying Jesus for a measly sum of money, or we can go to the scripture from the Gospels of Peter betraying Jesus where the cock crowed three times. He did it for a measly bit of reputation, maybe, or to not be persecuted. We can even go to the Old Testament prophets who foreshadowed Christ and see 
the suffering that they went through by being betrayed by the community of believers. Wow, what a beautiful opportunity for this woman in the midst of her betrayal to experience an intimacy and a connectedness with Christ in that suffering, to know that she is not alone and that Christ's response gives her an opportunity to learn her own response, to be Christ in that situation. Another response to ungodly situations can be to find meaning. This is a great response when our suffering is pervasive and unavoidable. Viktor Frankl, in his famous book, Man's Search for Meaning, explains that joy can be found in suffering when it's rooted in meaning. Viktor Frankl is an Auschwitz concentration camp survivor. And he began to notice in the concentration camp that there were certain prisoners who seemed to just be shriveling up and dying. Dying even before the threat of the gas chamber. And then Viktor Frankl recognized that there were other prisoners who seemed to even be joyful in the midst of their suffering. That they seemed to be thriving despite these horrible, horrible conditions. And Viktor Frankl began to study <laughs> what was the difference, this radical difference between, between these two prisoners. And what he discovered was that the prisoners who were joyful and who seemed to be thriving in this very desert experience, this horrible, painful experience, those were the prisoners who had found meaning in their suffering. And by meaning, I'm not talking about asking God, God, why are you doing this to me? Not that sort of meaning, but rather to find little reasons to get up in the morning. Little but significant reasons, whys, to get out of bed and to live and to love. That might have been a prisoner who saw a child whose parents had already died, and the prisoner chose to be that foster parent to that child. Or a prisoner who saw that another prisoner was beginning to waste away. He or she wasn't getting enough food, and they chose to give part of their daily bread to that prisoner. Viktor Frankl connected this to what the philosopher Nietzsche wrote when he said, he who has a why to live for can bear with almost any how. So those prisoners who are saying, how can we possibly survive this? The ones who thrived and experienced joy in the suffering were the ones who came up with the, why am I going to get out of bed today? Maybe in the midst of your ungodly situation, you're faced with a similar question. Maybe you're being invited by God to find meaning in the midst of that suffering. And to find meaning in the suffering is to find joy. Now let's look at Tonglen. Tonglen is actually Tibetan for giving and taking or sending and receiving. And it refers to a meditation practice found in Tibetan Buddhism. This particular response is a great one when the ungodly situation that we're suffering has stirred up a lot of negative emotions in us. The practice basically can be summed up as us taking time in prayer to breathe in the negative and to breathe out the blessing. If you've never tried this practice, I invite you to, and it will almost seem counterintuitive because we live in a world that actually tells us that we should be breathing in all that is good. We should be consuming from the world all that is good, and we should be discarding, dumping out on people all that is bad. 
But this prayer practice, while rooted in Buddhism, is very Christian, invites us to the exact opposite, that we are to be transformers of what is negative, just drawing it into the new spirit of Christ, and then to share with the world the very things we desire to breathe out that blessing. It reminds me of those gospel passages like the gospel of John in which Jesus, we're told, breathed on the apostles. He breathed peace on them. He breathed the Holy Spirit upon them. So we are Christ-like when we breathe out onto the world or even onto the people who have hurt us, that spirit of mercy, love, forgiveness, acceptance, gentleness, equanimity. What a beautiful, beautiful gift of Tonglen. So let's go back now to the ungodly situation that's been on your mind and in your heart. Which of these four godly responses most resonated with your heart? Was there a particular one that seemed very applicable to the suffering that you're going through right now or that a family member is going through right now? This presentation is virtually worthless unless it's applicable to our own personal situation and circumstance. So I really hope, I pray, that one or more of these might be a beautiful opportunity for prayer, a practice that draws you ever deeper into the image and likeness of Christ that you were created to be. I hope and pray that these help to transform you and I into Christ, that we might help to be transformers of the world, or as the Gospels say, that you and I might help to bring forth the kingdom of God. May God bless you.